Welcome, everyone. Uh, there is nothing that I would like more to be doing in my last two hours at the Art Institute of Chicago than standing here and getting ready to welcome my friends and two artists who I respect very much post-commodity. So thank you for joining us, and I hope that if you haven't seen their really remarkable installation on the Bloom Terrace, that you will go see that right after we're done today, because the weather is perfect for it. Post Commodity is an interdisciplinary arts collective that was founded in 2007. And uh, while they've had various members throughout the years, uh, never more than four at one time, uh, but there have been five total, um, the collective is currently made up of two artists, um, artists, Cade Twist, who is an associate professor at Otis College of Art and Design in Los Angeles. He's the area head of art and social practice. And the second uh, artist is Dr. Cristobal Martinez, who is assistant professor, chair of art and technology at the San Francisco Art Institute. Um, as I said, the collective was founded in 2007. Cade is one of the founding members of the collective, and Cristobal joined it in 2009. And the, uh, the members of the collective have lived in different areas, although it's primarily been based in the southwest of the United States. And indeed, the uh, three of us met each other when we were all graduate students, um, along with some of the other former members. Uh, when we were in Phoenix at Arizona State University. And I was really drawn to them because of a shared interest in uh, the US-Mexico border, which is an inescapable issue, as you might imagine, living that close to the border. Uh, but they also were invited to do a really wonderful, or what turned out to be a really wonderful installation or intervention at the Arizona State University Art Museum at the time in which they um, cut a slab of, of the floor that the museum sits on to reveal the red earth beneath it, which they had researched and learned was built on uh, in Indian burial grounds. And they um, had suspended a microphone over the red earth, and there was a hidden speaker that projected a peeposh ceremony. So it became this very um, solemn and ceremonious space but also one that was visually very beautiful and um, had a really lovely minimal quality. And I think that that actually describes a lot of their work and is one of the reasons that I've been interested in them over the, the years that we met and as I've been watching them grow and mature as artists. So this is really such a wonderful sort of swan song for me personally to have been able to invite them to do a very Chicago-centric project here at the Art Institute, which they will talk to you more about. I just want to talk about a couple more of their achievements before I welcome them to the stage. Uh, Post Commodity are the recipients of grants from the Joan Mitchell Foundation in 2010, also Creative Capital in 2012, Art Matters in 2013, Native Arts and Cultures Foundation in 2014, Mid-Atlantic Arts Foundation in 2017, and Ford Foundation Art of Change Fellowship in 2017 and 18. The collective, <clears throat> excuse me, has been exhibited nationally and internationally, including the 18th Biennial of Sydney in Sid Sydney, Australia, the 2017 Whitney Biennial, Documenta 14 in Athens and Kassel, the 57th Carnegie International in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania last year, and their historic land art installation, perhaps what they're no most known for, the repellent fence, which was shown along the US-Mexico border near Douglas, Arizona, and Agua Prieta, Sonora. The collective was awarded the fine prize for their contribution to the Carnegie International's 2018 um, exhibition and uh, their wonderful installation there was called From Smoke and Tangled Waters They Carried Fire Home. I think that I've done enough of an introduction. These two are exceptionally articulate and have a really great overview of their practice and their work planned. We are going to reserve a little bit of time at the end. We'll do a little set change and move over there. So do hold your questions because they're very interested in taking them and me too, if you have anything for me. But for now, please join me in welcoming Kate and Cristobal to the stage. 
good. Mm-hmm. Seems like morning still. But uh, good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us. Um, I'd like to start off by just thanking uh, Leica and acknowledging her work, her vision, her capacity to navigate an institution, um, as well as, as Ann Goldstein for providing support throughout that process, as well as all of the staff who supported this work. It, um, as you may imagine when you see it, if you haven't seen it already, it, it was a challenge to, to, to install here, not because of any institutional put, pushback, just purely out of logistics and limitations. So it was a beautiful experience uh, to work with an institution that had the desire and will um, and leveraged every ounce of it you know, to work with us. Appreciate it. Did you want to say a thank you or anything? Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. OK. Um, I'd like to, um, yeah, we're going to clip that off. First, I, I would like to open with a prayer. So if you have hats, if you could remove them. Um, oh, brothers and sisters, north and south, from pyramids dismantled into Catholic churches, from mounds plowed into memory beneath suburban homes. Let us gather and pray together for the UNESCO sites between us. Thank you, amen. Post-commodities art functions as a shared indigenous lens and voice to engage the complex and multi-ethnic forms of colonization that are defining the 21st century. We as a collective are particularly responsive to ever-increasing velocities and complex forms of violence. And while being sensitive to these realities, our purpose is to aestheticize the complexity of systems that we as humans generate and maintain in the world. We aspire to produce aesthetic representations of reality that are more generative than oversimplified realities that we, um, as humans often and instinctually assume. Our intentions through our work are to promote a constructive discourse that challenges the social, political, and economic processes that are destabilizing communities and geographies and to connect indigenous narratives of cultural self-determination with the broader public sphere. And I apologize for reading that, but I just wanted to make sure it was clearly articulated without any jumbling or forgot, you know, forgetfulness. Thank you. Yeah, today we're going to be doing a combination of, you know, some stuff is script and scripted, and then we're going to we're also going to be speaking from the heart and extemporaneously. We just want to be very precise with our language. And one of the things that often happens uh, to to Kate and I is we we. We often get the question, well, you know, why does it take a collective to do the things that you do in the world? And so uh, one response is that we've turned not to the myth of the genius, but to the power of the collective and to group consensus for uh, the recovery of knowledge. Uh, We feel that in today's world, it's not enough for just myself or Cade to individually rationalize our complex world. Uh, We've always believed that no matter the circumstances, the sum of a collective's parts is greater than those of the individual. It is with this belief and value that we aspire to make large-scale works of art that can hold many complicated narratives at once. We have always uh, seen our work through an indigenous worldview um, of where we are, therefore I am. As collective, as in tribe, and certainly not as an organized group of individual and independent authors. In our work, we function as a learning community. It's built into the DNA of our collective. That DNA is to educate each other and to bring our interdisciplinary skills to to bear upon the, the, the world. Uh, this kind of uh, work, you know, being able to understand the world through something that's other than a singular perspective is, is really aspirational for us, and it's, it's hard work. 
Um, in post Kamari, we have decades of public affairs experience in some of the highest forms of government and also an education designed to better respond to the needs and expectations of indigenous youth. As an interdisciplinary collective, we're engineers, poets, rhetors, and conceptual thinkers, linguists, thought leaders, scholars, educators, musicians, and artists. Especially today, it takes many disciplines to make works of art with the ability to catalyze conversations that might otherwise be difficult for us to engage. And now I wanna briefly um, uh, share with you why we do what we do. Uh, so here, a little personal anecdote. Um, I was raised in northern New Mexico. I, I come from a little pueblito called Alcalde, New Mexico. It's situated in the upper Rio Grande Valley, about midway between Santa Fe and Taos. And in that high desert plateau, um, diplomacy over sharing water and other resources has always been tantamount to our people's survival. And so diplomacy is in my blood. My blood is in the water. In post-commodity, uh, we're driven by how our family and communities um, raised us. And so I'm complicated, and I imagine that all, all of you are complicated as well, especially given all the things going on in the world today. I also imagine that we are all complicated just because. So I'm also not a perfect person. I'm not afraid to implicate myself as a living and breathing part of the world, the, our noisy world. I see my work in post-commodity as the greatest expression of honoring knowledge and loving my family, and that's what Kate and I believe. We believe this jointly and together. We work to extend our generosity to the extent of our reach, which is to provide a shared indigenous lens by which interested publics might have an opportunity to see the world through our collective's indigenous worldview. Indigenous worldviews today are largely uh, lacking in public spaces. Every day in post-commodity, we witness our sacred ancestral homelands pimped out as in exploited and polluted, as our cousins from south of the border are cast as aliens. Without an indigenous lens, the public will not see that our brothers and sisters from south of the border couldn't be further from aliens since they are indigenous to this hemisphere to begin with. We do this to transform institutions that were never designed for persons like me and Cade or collectives like us. So I wanted to lead us through a series of questions, um, four in particular, really simple questions, just modes of inquiry to, for us to discuss the piece with you. Um, and again, there, there will be a time, uh, plenty of time after our, our presentation here for, uh, for us to exchange questions and answers together. Uh, so I don't, I don't mean to circumvent the audience with asking myself questions here. Um, okay, so fundamentally, um, this gets asked a lot thus far, and it's why did we do this piece? You know, why this material? Why this place? Why that? Those things? And um, that's a really hard question. It's almost like why do you breathe? It's 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 really it's a tough question to answer honestly, and. Um, so for a piece like this, I mean, we did this to mark time. You know, we are at a historic moment in U.S. history uh, where we're seeing one of the largest migrations from south to north um, and one of the most significant migrations since the black migrations of the, of the late 19th century and, and 20th century. So. Chicago was one of the ground zeros for that migration, and we've all had the opportunity to witness the beauty that has come from that. You know, new art forms, new, new forms of, of creative expression, new music, new ideas, 
um, but also new agents of community organizing, new agents of community self-determination being exercised within a sea of, of competing interests. And for the first time in, in the United States, you saw the rise of what people have referred to from time to time as a chocolate city, a, a place of black power and presence and genius. And that will always exist in Chicago. This, will, this migration of brown people, of indigenous people from south to north, are not going to displace that or, or remove it or challenge it. They will just add another layer to that process and learn from the experiences and knowledge recovered from their experiences of the previous black migrations. So you're seeing a model be vindicated, a, a model of, of black self-determination be vindicated by a new migration building on lessons learned from it. So that's first and foremost what we're trying to do. And why did we choose that particular form, the Castillo as, as it's known, the, the structure of, of cement blocks with uh, steel rebar poking out? It's um, a monument to the unfinished, the incomplete, the act of becoming, the act of transitioning, of growing, um, spiritually, physically, culturally, familiarly. Um, so it became a vessel to carry that, uh, that experience and that knowledge, but it became a semiotic vessel to also mark time and a place. Um, it's on that third floor, so it gives us a chance to hold that out for the city um, and for all people. It's in the free space of the museum, so before museums are the museums open, after the museums open, during museum hours, it's an opportunity for publics to engage the work and to view the work, but also to implicate themselves as they're viewing the work and for a moment to hold themselves accountable to what is really happening and why these migrations uh, are, are happening. So, um Another question that, that we're often asked is, how did the context influence our thinking? And so one of the things that we often do as a collective is we try to, every time we get invited to a city or a place to make a work of art, we always try to uh, position ourselves as, as guests and see ourselves as invited guests. And what that means is, that means that's an opportunity for us to educate ourselves about a people or a place. So we never come to a place with, we try not to come to places with assumptions. We try not to make assumptions about who people are, what cities are, or places. Or, so we try to, um, we try to transform ourselves into ears for listening and try to learn. One of the things that we, we learned in Chicago was that it's the home of a, of a historic academic cohort called uh, the Chicago School or Chicago School of Economics. Uh, the Chicago School of Economics was a, a cohort, but it was also a discourse. It was a, a way of thinking about uh, free market economies and theories. And uh, so conceptually, uh, Chicago became this uh, really interesting place for us to situate the uh, conversation about the growing uh, Latin American demography of the city. And we thought it was interesting that that demography situated in Chicago, um, that it was happening in the city in relationship to the Chicago School of Economics. Because uh, since, the, since the 1800s, uh, there have been a series of theories funded by Ford, by Rockefeller, controlled by the CIA and other federal agencies to use Latin America as a laboratory 
for economic development. And so that use of Latin America as a laboratory for US economic development was incentivized. It was incentivized by fellowships and scholarships and inviting young, aspiring uh, minds from Latin America to come to the United States to become educated in new economic theory. Those incentives were always, and this is clearly in all the academic research, always in the interest of American corporations at the expense of citizens throughout Latin America. This has led to hyperinflation in Latin America, and this has also led to a really, um, a really sour uh, unemployment rates. And when these incentives, when these neoliberal incentives didn't work, the US resorted to military operations in order to have control over our hemisphere. We wanted to draw the connection between the visions of using people for human subjects research in relationship to the migrations that we're seeing today and that changing demography. And so now we have to think about those consequences through a metaphor that's generative, one that doesn't look at this as a us versus them kind of scenario, but one that poses the challenge to the citizens of Chicago and really uh, throughout the country and throughout the world. Migration is a reality and what do we need to do to be generative about it so that we can grow as a people? So that makes me think of something that I'd like to see a show of hands. Um, how many of you all are familiar with the term placemaking, creative placemaking? Any of you believe in it? You know, it's typically a, a marketing ploy of a development company working with, you know, a government agency and a handful of nonprofits um, to, uh, you know, to access a couple million dollars from the philanthropic sector that can be leveraged with governmental dollars. And typically it's placemaking for a market to be realized in a new way, to, um, to connect a, a neighborhood to the economy in a way that it's previously not connected. But rarely, rarely if ever, is it really for culture for the production of culture and the enjoyment of cultural production. So one of the things that this work does is it brings something familiar from home for the people who have traveled here from far away. Um, these Castillos are, um, are part of the landscape um, where folks from Mexico and Central America uh, lived. So this act can be perceived hopefully as an, an, an ephemeral and poetic act of placemaking in a way that is very, very sincere in its actions. Um, because that act of building place must reflect the realities experienced through their cultures. And also, um, their metaphorical strategies for articulating their self-determination, their cultural self-determination, and their cultural sovereignty um, in a new place. So it's an odd form to, to look at. And, and like many complex forms that are embedded with so many different narratives, whether they're perceived as competing narratives or unified narratives, um, there's, there's going to there's a, a certain amount of complexity there that might invite um, dismissing it or overloading this very simple concept with, with so much. 
But if you look at how we think about language and just use the words up and down, and if you try to disaggregate those words from your metaphorical construction of your position in the world, um, it's, it becomes really complicated. So we believe um, that these structures can and do contain and project um, that much uh, cultural knowledge, but that much will and desire of a people to hack systems to create a space for themselves regardless of cost. So I'm just going to loop us back around a little bit. Um, this is a little retrograde, but the, uh, the installation that uh, we have uh, constructed here at the Art Institute of Chicago, again titled with each incentive, is comprised of 18 columns. Um, we refer to them as, uh, in ha as how they're referred to in Latin America, which is castillos. And these castillos are of uh, various heights. Uh, the tallest ones are stand uh, 21 feet, um, and the shortest ones are at four feet. And just to give you a little bit of background about them, they're fairly ubiquitous throughout Latin America. They're architectural um, columns that usually protrude off the top of um, buildings and houses. And uh, what they are is um, they, they represent, uh, as Kate was saying earlier, a, uh, something that is in process, something that is always becoming or emerging. And so as the family grows, you already have the columns and the rebar in place, and so it's easy to add an addition onto the, onto the house. And that's a very pragmatic approach, and that's a very symbolic of indigenous pragmatism. Um, we, we've oftentimes been asked, well, you know, how does this, how does this work metaphorically and as Cade was saying earlier about language, that there's, there's a lot of complexity there, but at a very simple level, it's, it's the idea that we need to be prepared to grow our family. And that means that we have to begin to do a lot of soul searching and a lot of thinking about how we do that jointly and, and together. And the, the last question is, that we often get was, is uh, how was this a collaboration with the institution and, and construction company? And so something that we do uh, often in our work is that we, we think we're, we're from institutions. We're fully implicated. We're heads of departments and institutions. And so we have a little bit of, of insight into how messy they are and how challenging they are. We're, we also believe in them. And um, a lot of our work is sort of turning social practice back in on itself so that some of those um, changes, some social changes in art are happening within the walls of the institution. We were very fortunate to have the opportunity to work here at the Art Institute of Chicago because there was a, a spirit of thinking about what it means to, to grow and emerge and, and become. And so we had to, um, we, we really worked very closely with our curator, Leica, who negotiated the, the very um, complicated uh, infrastructures of the institution to do everything from, you know, get the rubber stamp on, on this structure, which is very heavy and designed uh, so that uh, the, the architecture can support it to, the gravity of the rhetoric itself and what we are trying to articulate, especially now in a time of conflict and controversy. And, and so with that in mind, we'd like to share with you uh, a set of our aspirations with some poetry and prose. And one of the main reasons why we're sharing this, um, these aspirations with you, is because it frames the work. This is part of a larger body of work that we're doing that's looking at um, south to north migrations. It's a, the, the south to north, north to south migrations uh, in indigenous communities have a long, long history. 
um, they've been taking place since time immemorial. So um, part of that, uh, acknowledging the migrations is also acknowledging, acknowledging the complexity of uh, the, our demographic realities and political realities uh, in the United States. By 2043, the U.S. Census Bureau is projecting that white people will no longer be the majority in the United States. Um, we come from communities where white people have always been the minority, so we have experience in, in how that plays out, um, in, you know, governmentally, uh, socially, politically, locally. Um, but a, a huge part of these aspirations are to ask ourselves, how do we make meaning together without cultural chauvinism? For instance, how, how do we make meaning or determine what truth may be if truth and meaning is always framed primarily uh, from a Judeo-Christian Western scientific worldview? So in other words, how do we step outside of the limitations of that one particularized body of knowledge, that one particular epistemology, and, and determine truth with other epistemologies? other forms of meaning, other cultural framing. Did you want to add oh, to that? that yeah, that is so um, important. And I just want to add that, um, you know, earlier I listed all these disciplines, you know, that were basically, fr I was framing post-commodity as an interdisciplinary collective. Talked about how we're engineers and linguists and, and we work in public affairs and so forth. But we're, we're also one of, one of the places where we draw our strength as a collective is, is through, through connected knowledge action and thinking about visual knowledge across multiple worldviews. And so um, I think that's really important. So it's not only interdisciplinary, but it's also connected knowledge that, um, that we use in order to to, to move forward. And, um, and real quick, um, I didn't talk about the construction company, but there was a contractor hired who built this. And, and I just want to say something really brief, that the construction company, what was really powerful about this um, moment in working with them is that they, had a con they were a connected knowledge body of people. They had, it was very clear that people were coming from many different backgrounds. And what was so beautiful about it is their ability to work together as a team. And that was very, uh, the president of the company himself was on site. It was very meaningful to him. And so we just had to be, we just had the great privilege of being in the presence of, of, an, of an example of the very thing we're trying to communicate through this work of art. And so we just want to acknowledge that, and we'll get started. All right. uh, introduction. As if you had to be honest and sincere, how do you see the land? As if you had just been waterboarded for one hour, how do you see yourself? As if you had no other choice, how do you configure reality as if the realization of survival is near, how do you order our history? As if you believed there was another way, how do you live with the things you imagine to be true? Introduction, take two. Do you have an obsessive compulsion to make things in your image and or remake unfamiliar things in your image, especially if they appear broken or inefficient, and or cut and paste the beauty of somewhere else on top of the beauty that was already here, and or achieve, or I'm sorry, and or archive in a privileged database and delete the references and withhold the rest. Are these aesthetic concerns? or esoteric dreams let loose upon the earth as unrecognizable bacteria. The future, like the past, is more than viruses. 
Though viruses, my love, will always define our relationship. Two, are these cultural concerns? or simply frameworks of velocity running across a horizon as engines within engines, miniaturized, optimized, grounded in hard science. Post-commodities aspiration is to use contemporary art to open portals. With these portals, we, for a brief moment, reconfigure time and place so that we may pry the world open and give ourselves a chance to look at and appreciate with courage the simple complexity of life. Perhaps in aestheticizing complexity, we can catalyze publics to realize that partisanship in this country has desocialized us from one another and disciplined us away from consensus. In mediating complexity, we aspire to add value to the art world's cultural competencies so that it is better equipped for the future as the demography of the United States shifts to a future majority comprised of people of color. Perhaps by contributing to the art world with these intentions, we will help to pave a more desirable future for us all by encouraging advances in writing history, curation, and criticism. And art making. <laughs> uh, three. There is no epistemology to share that hasn't already been shared willingly or unwillingly. No shadow of brown irrationality that hasn't already been taken away from home and transformed into collateral damage and capital rendered and dreamed. Vertically imagined as private investment and in infrastructure, year upon year, generation upon generation, century upon generation. There is no linear history, only strategic remembering. If you look east or west or north or south, the next season has already been accounted for and leveraged. Regardless of intention or worldview, there is an accounting in one form or another with disputed evidence. So how do we remember together truthfully above water with our land between us as witnesses? We speak to you from yesterday, now, and tomorrow. It is time to break the feedback loop, not across your forehead like a two by four with street fighting intentions. Instead, we're here to invite your participation and complexity to our table, not as an ambush or implication of force, but as a generative action. The work of post-commodity is not political protest, but instead is designed so that through our relationship with land, place, and each other, we may recover knowledge, generate new knowledge, and share knowledge at sites of contest, controversy, conflict, and consequence. In our work, we aim to disarm these sites and reimagine them as places of curiosity where rivals who are amenable to transformation can come together to engage in joint inquiry. Post-commodity aspires to knowledge, to acknowledge the genocidal visual culture and sonic warfare in the United States born of manifest destiny. With so many of us unwittingly, which so many of us unwittingly play with under the guise of freedom in art school and institutions. Our work is to flip the script on a largely non-inclusive art world, where peoples of color are all too often encouraged to obsess about and dramatize their identities for the theoretical and racializing gaze of the powerful and privileged. In terms of theoretical gazes, I'm implicated here. Yes, I'm a brown person. I'm also a professor. In terms of racism, I am a brown person, and critical theories of race presuppose that part of our reality is that we people of color can also, we can be hegemonic. In post-commodity, we aspire to be thought leaders, not poster children for whatever is expected of us as quote-unquote indigenous. 
Disclaimer one. 2043 is the year the future majority take back this nation, statistically speaking. 2043 is the year white people become the most powerful minority in the history of the United States. Let us pray together for transparency, respectful relationships, relevancy, reciprocity, responsibility, and redistribution. Because transitions like this can be as humbling as 500 years of heavy wind. Let's pray together because the time has come to learn how to listen honorably. The we now and we tomorrow can no longer be the we yesterday. From this point forward, we need to dig beyond the song and dance. We need to slow down and walk through source code together. Despite dilemmas in our complicated humanity, our aspirations are to educate the art world's future thought leaders, regardless of background or identity, and to encourage our students to think about human challenges and problems that exist beyond just mere identity politics during this time of climate change and systems stresses to practice and teach a thoughtful and generative art about the world, both from and beyond the self, based on generosity, vulnerability, diplomacy, stewardship, reciprocity, respect, scholarship, patience, relationships, and listening. As a collective, Far from naive, we must ask ourselves, does all that we have presented today represent a brown shadow labor that will be monetized and weaponized against us? Perhaps when we people of color are hegemonic and we fail to operate as a group through consensus, we end up empowering that leverage. Perhaps we must learn to move beyond damage-centered and racializing identity narratives. Perhaps we must, even in the darkest times, lead with knowledge and great humor. The question is, do you want to work together? You know, beyond the framework of the extraction and processing industries, beyond manifested destinies of white economies of taste. For instance, is it possible to work towards something that isn't remade in your image? Disclaimer two. If we didn't think so, we wouldn't be writing you this love poem. The truth is we know you want it, and we know you want it just as bad as we do. Please don't tell me you're lazy in bed or out of shape, children, family, debt, and divorce. There are piles of research and analysis out there larger than New York refuse dumps. It's out there and totally accessible. We're also here walking among you every day of your life. And a quick epilogue. Have you ever heard the words, I love you from a person of color? an indigenous person, or a Cambodian, or a Nigerian, or a Syrian. It, you know, it happens every single day without miracles, or rigor, or theory. There's nothing to it. Epilogue, alternate take. At some point, for the love of the creator, each other, and our earth, we need to build together a pedagogy for listening, like elders. You know, and we know, that if white people can build nuclear arsenals, space stations, and algorithmic markets, it's perfectly logical to believe we can sit down together and build a reliable system to redistribute aesthetic and cultural power. Thank you. Thank you.
We've got about five more minutes, and um, that was such a great presentation. I um, did just want to ask something that I imagine a lot of people are wondering about. On the slides that we're projecting here, um, interspersed with the installation images, oops, um, yeah, control it from up there, um, are images of a codex that Post Commodity created in conjunction with this show. So could I um, just ask you to say a few words about that? So um, we're inspired by traditional uh, indigenous codices. Uh, these codices are oftentimes associated with Mayans and Aztecs, but all indigenous people had various ways of keeping records and marking time. Um, encoding knowledge and uh, also um, uh, setting forth prophecies. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to assemble a, a visual knowledge that helped to um, sort of jog the social amnesia about indigenous peoples as if Mexicans and Native Americans, for example, uh, aren't, a lot of the social amnesia, amnesia seems to suggest we're not related. And that those things are tied to nationalisms, the nationalism of the Plains Indian or the nationalism of the Mesoamerican. And so we wanted to complicate that. And so we put this uh, codice together. We also wanted to mark the actions of the Chicago School of Economics and to also uh, demonstrate how our indigenous knowledge systems have been exploited, uh, both for economic value, but uh, in ways that they've also been, in a manner to which they've also been turned against us. And we were setting out to do something really simple, is just create a zine, you know, that we could give out online, you know, maybe a downloadable. And, and there's going to be a black and white version of this. It'll be uh, downloadable for free off the, off the website. But we wanted to stick with the tradition of zines is a bunch of images really constructed from personal experience and from the public realm organize them into a body of knowledge and add words to it that mean something to a group of people. And, you know, it just so happens that in the act of doing that, it got way more complicated and it ended up looking like this. I think it, I blame Gerald McMaster. He's a curator where we, we've worked with in the past and we're working with again on a, on a really a 15,000 square foot museum show for 2021 and he wanted us to stop using the term visual culture and to use the term visual knowledge because he thought the term visual culture was was limiting and the more we talked with him the more we you know learned his perspectives on that the more this became a codec and less of a zine and the more hours poured it you know poured into its construction <laughs> So that will be for sale in the museum shop, hopefully as of tomorrow. It's a limited edition run and it's really beautiful. Um, but we'd like to turn the floor over. Um, we're in a small room, so if you have a question, um, just project, yeah, in the back. Um, I didn't really understand. What, what does they mean? What does they have those uh, columns mean? <coughs> The columns are referring to an architectural feature you oftentimes see in Latin America. That feature is usually appended to, uh, to houses and buildings, and it signifies uh, growth, or it sort of incentivizes growth. It's also an opportunity, uh, it's a form of pragmatism that, for example, if, if you built your house, you would have 
you would add these columns to to your home in anticipation that you may need to construct an extra room, for example, if your family grows, you have a child, and the columns and rebar are already in place for growth. It's kind of in progress, a work in progress. That's exactly right. But, but we like to think about it as, as a, a, a work or a worldview that is always becoming. An important part of many indigenous peoples, you know, worldview is is this disdain towards the concept of a finished thing, of permanence, of a human making their mark on this world, like a like a skyscraper, as if it'll last forever. You know, the um, just the the ego that gets folks into trouble, I think. Um, that idea of permanence is antithetical to, to, I think, an indigenous worldview, which is always evolving, growing, becoming, adapting. Um, definitely uh, anything you would think of with ephemerality. Um, you know, you can look at our ceremonies and, and things of that nature. It's um, They happen overnight, oftentimes with an intention on, on trans, a transformative experience. It's not codified, it's not repeated. It's not like a Catholic church where you're gonna have the same service every year on the same day, you know, um, that's been preordained in a book. Um, so it, we, we, there isn't that legacy um, in the traditional sense of the word of, of what a legacy is constructed as in, 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 in the Western imagination. So it, it's, it's a really nice tuning instrument um, to have a conversation around very simple um, modes in which we sense the world and um, the biases that we bring to the table as we sense the world. We have our bias of, of privileging the ephemeral um, the Judeo-Christian Western world has the bias of privileging the permanent. Um, so the finished, the complete, the whole, um, the ordained. So we have to find, um, we have to acknowledge our biases and, and start talking about the middle ground. And it's a really good tool for facilitating that conversation, I think. You, if I can just add in really plain language, you guys use the word pragmatism a lot, and also the word hack um, comes up a lot as we talk. And economically speaking, something like this also allows people who maybe have a little bit of money to start a project to start, and maybe then it sits while more money is earned, and then things can be added on to as needed. Also, in talking with many of you and other people over the last couple of months, I've had people bring up, oh yeah, I, I saw stuff like this all over Egypt. I personally remember seeing this sort of construction uh, in Greece where people may leave these half-built columns, columns on uh, an upper floor of a house, and um, as soon as somebody, a child got married, they could add on and move up. So it, it is a very pragmatic approach to um, to living. Mm -hmm. Yes, in the back. Uh, where is this structure located? Uh, on our third floor, so you, you have to walk all the way through the modern wing and um, follow the signs to Terzo Piano or the Bloom Terrace. But it's on our third floor, looking out at Millennium Park. Yeah. Many, many of these structures are built with money from immigrants that come to the U.S., you know, family members, and they send money to build these houses. And I was just wondering if you could talk about that. Thank you. You know, the, the, um, one of the things that uh, we think about in our work is how, how things are cyclical, like how they feed back. And, that's where the title of the piece comes, with each incentive. Like the idea that in my home, I, I have these castillos, and I'm perhaps um, 
preparing to have a family. Um, it's like the the Castillo incentivizes me. It sort of it's sort of the promise of having a family. And then at the same time, I'm incentivized to have them because we've learned that in some parts of Latin America, like in Peru or the people, if you have these columns uh, coming out of your home, there would, you could get certain tax exemptions because you could com you can claim your house to be in progress and not finished. And I mean, the idea is that like you're, the column is like incentivizing you to grow your family and the government is incentivizing you to have the column and and then of course so everything is in a relationship right and so um i think that's a, a an, an analogy for the relationships that we're seeing in in the western hemisphere because the the trade policies the corporate activities are are completely inequitable and so the people have to find a way to create their own economy. If not, we can't survive. The, the system isn't just for survival. And so I just want to thank you for, for bringing that up. And I just wanted to try to uh, make the connection that we see, you know, the relationship as uh, much bigger than corporations and the government, but that uh, indigenous people, whether people in Mexico see themselves as indigenous or not. I mean, the the word Mexico is an indigenous word, and that that's how we've come to view it, but that we will always find a way. We find a way to survive. And so I'd see this as de definitely a marker of that economic exchange that's happening. I just wanted to comment on the the sending money back home. Uh, it's, it just so happens that that's one of the you know primary focuses of new immigration policy that Trump is the Trump administration is developing is to monitor and to prevent families from sending money home um, and to 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 make it a, an illegal act. I hate to say this, we're out of time. I see that there's one more question. Um, I think that anybody that needs to leave uh, should be welcome to leave, and we could stay up here for a few more minutes and answer questions. Thank you so much for coming today, and please go visit the installation. Do, yeah, it seems like no one's running, so yeah. <laughs> Um, I was wondering if you guys were aware of like the situation with like the Crown family and general dynamics and the art institute and if you guys were working in this place right now, which is at the intersection of something very similar, and how you guys negotiate with the fact that the Crown family is associated with defense companies that are implicated in family separation policies in the border and the Trump administration. Yeah. Are you making a project? Uh, I just... We want to jump on we that really question. We really do, don't do you we? Want to, do you, I'll, I'll, do just, I'll just say one thing really quick. You know, the, there, there is a large, a large, demo, the large, one large dem, demographic in the U.S. Border Patrol is Mexican-Americans. And so uh, what, 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 what would we do? We would take the money, we'd spend it to make art because that's our role. And our role is we had shared with each other a little earlier to try to sense what's going on. And to sense what's going on is not to shut it down. So we shut it down, we don't have those resources. We can't have that conversation. So what happens if, if we run everybody out of town? How are we gonna have that conversation? That's gonna be government regulated? I'd rather have people assuaging their guilt. I'd rather have corporations assuaging their guilt 
so that we have an opportunity to speak than I have to deal with governments. That's just one answer, but we have many, we have a lot more to add, so. Well, you know, the one, I, I'm, I'm, but I'm Cherokee, you know, and, um, you know, that's a, it, it, from my experience, my family's experience, the histories that I've been told and studied, um, I can't find anything that can rationalize money as clean in any context. Um, these companies that you've mentioned, um, there's nothing special about that to me whatsoever. Um, they're, they're no different than any other large multinational corporation, you know, producing something to sell something for someone. Um, every bit of equity and capital that exists in the United States of America today is accruing interest um, out of blood money out of land resources labor that were taken at gunpoint um, there has been genocides uh, multiple genocides i am a survivor of genocide there's not a lot of cherokee people left in the world there's not a lot of people left that speak our language as as a native person so um, when i think of general dynamics i could give a fuck and when I think of people protesting that, I could give a bigger fuck. You know, what happens at the Whitney, I could give a rat's ass about the Whitney too. And the artists in it and their desire to, to moralize something comes from an intense naivete. So should that naivete be forgiven? Absolutely. You know, should it be respected? For sure. You know, they have the right to do that. And I would probably stand there and support them if I was in that show with them. I would hug some of them that had problems with it. I'd also tell them, you know, at night when we're having drinks together, that it's all bullshit. And the, you cannot disaggregate um, violence, enslavement, um, genocide from any dollar bill you've ever put in your pocket. So you have to implicate yourself as someone who probably carries a dollar bill in your pocket. And all of us here, we all contribute willingly to this as consumers. We post our shit on Instagram advocating for our right and our power as consumers to do the most stupid shit ever thought of. And it's feeding it and feeding it and feeding it and we exist in an entire sea of noise about consumption, self-love, self-aggrandizement and money. And just, so, so it's just as hard as many people who hunger for justice seek to disaggregate themselves from from that blood money in their pocket, we we were all born into a system to which that's just not possible. In in the world we live in, it's certainly not possible as being an artist and um, participating in the discourse of art. I think it's interesting that the world of art is complicated. I never saw it as a site for justice or a site for morality. I just saw it as an opportunity to, to dream in ways that are human, not puritanical or parochial. Do, is everyone okay for another question? <laughs> okay, you had your hand up in the middle. Yeah, I have a question. You mentioned that you see the difference several times. So how do you see the distribution pattern? I'll give an example. 
example, I have performance in Finland. So my professor was not really fit where he was head of the department. So when the country fell apart, he was kicked out because he was not native by the people who he kind of taught. They grew under him. He was much better scientist than they were, but they kicked him out because he wasn't native. So when we talk about redistribution after different majorities come into power, how do you see it to happen? What would be the principle? And to me, from all of your observation, I cannot be more agree with you on the need to change from simplicity, you know, our desire to imagine Focus. simple complexity, mm -hmm. but the redistribution of this is one word that kind of kept coming and kept bothering me. That, that's because it, it's, it, it's, there are many, if you use that word, redistribution, and depending on the cultural framing, um, political framing, historical framing, it, it's going to mean things that are radically different. And, and I, I didn't define the use of it at the beginning like, in a, like I would in an academic, more academic lecture. But in this regard, I, I would ground that, that term in the the work that indigenous scholar, many indigenous scholars have been doing for the past 40 years is working um, to develop a, an indig a set of indigenous research methodologies. And um, depending on who you talk to in the group, there's four R's, there's five R's, there's six R's, whatever, and R's meaning the first letter of a word. So. One is um, respect. Um, in, in, in the context of community engagement, diplomacy, or research, um, you, you have to enter the room and, it, with respect. And you have to maintain respect. That, that's going to sustain you over the course of whatever the endeavor is, or, or your life, or however you want to apply that. The, the other thing is relationships. So that's the second R, relationships. We are nothing without our brothers and sisters. Nothing can be done independently. But really, it's, it's treating that relationship with honor, dignity, respect, privileging the power of that relationship, the medium of that relationship, the implications of it, and the interconnectedness. Most importantly, we're interconnected people, and our interconnectedness is often defined by the quality of our relationships. That's a, those are really important indigenous you know, ways of thinking. An, another um, would be reciprocity, to give back as you're, you're given to share. And that brings us into, and, and that's completing a cycle. You start something, you give it to me, I continue working with it and give it back to you. You being a community, a nation state, uh, a citizenry, or an individual. Me being another individual, citizenry, nation state, or, or what have you. Um, that, that gives us back to redistribution. And this is a really critical term because it flies in the face of what um, has been di what we've been disciplined to think is that redistribution is is communist in thinking. It's problematic. It um, undermines the the most significant form of of um, human achievement um, because if you achieve something, it should be rightfully yours. But that form of human achievement also undermines the experience of relationships and knowing that there's interconnectedness and how could any individual achievement be possible without people with you, behind you, and in front of you. So there's those things. But the, the redistribution that, um, that many indigenous scholars talk about, and it's not just Linda Smith, the, the Linda T. Smith, she's the, the um, Maori scholar um, who wrote the book Indigenous Research Methodologies. Um, this is about a years and years and years of subjugated populations being, um, you might say, destabilized 
to a point of organizational crisis so that things can be extracted. And we can look at some of the oldest um, multinational corporations we have on planet Earth are the mining, extracting, and processing industries. And um, how much of that gets redistributed to the communities from which they're extracting? or the nations that they're extracting. So it's only form of redistribution is in the form of a product that you have to then go purchase. You know, it it's really horrible in, in Indian country to where we, we are research uh, rich, but we're capital poor because all of the extractions that have happened have never been redistributed internally. They've always been exported and taken somewhere else and processed and then sold to us. So the idea is to redistribute the knowledge that is generated from research, first and foremost, back to the community that, that you're um, pulling and querying the knowledge from. It has to go back. It has to be contextualized and made relevant. Um, so that's the idea is sharing the knowledge that's recovered, sharing the resources that are recovered, um, those types of things. Um, so real simple. The other R is um, relevancy. Like why engage in a research endeavor, economic endeavor, or a social policy endeavor that is not relevant to the community that that work is supposed to take place in? It's not. How is it benefiting the community? How is it advancing that community's social, political, and cultural interests, goals, and objectives? You know, those types of things. And there's uh, the last words, like responsibility. Like you have to be accountable to yourself, to your relationships, to your family, you know, to the processes of relevancy redistribution. You know, so that's the context for the redistribution. So it's not an us or them perspective or nativist or non-nativist. It's uh, any endeavor that you're engaged in. If you're taking something from a group of people to achieve that endeavor, they should be included in the process. They should be respected in the process. They, there should be relationships built around them in the process, and then the results should be redistributed uh, among them. That's an indigenous way. That's how we've we've lived for a long, long, long time. Yeah. And you can think about the redistribution of power, property, uh, and you know, in those same um, contexts. And that's where the negotiation of meaning has to take place, is where is the value of redistribution quantified? You know, and through what mechanisms is it quantifiable? And then how, how is that administered? And if you just take those three subsets of questions and you analyze that from a policy framework, you'll have 10, 20 years of work because you'll have to reimagine the United States entire framework for managing our uh, our, econ our economic actions, our social actions, our, our you know, political actions. Thank you. That was such a good question. I know that there are more questions. I just want to respect everybody's time and give people an opportunity to stand up and go. Um, we could stay up here a little while longer. But thank you so much for joining us today and for your thoughtful questions. <laughs>